Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the uh, introduction and opportunity to give the talk. Um, I'll take you your head nod, Jim, that you can uh, see me and uh, this is working. I will, uh, so um, over the last 14 years or so of leading real-time computer graphics research, I've had the opportunity to observe researchers at a wide range of stages of their career from early stage, just starting out after graduate school, to researchers far more senior than myself with far more achievements and accolades than I ever hoped to achieve. What I'll share with those of you today who are, this talk is especially targeted at those of you who are in graduate school or in early stages of your career as a scientist. Um, our observations have made of behaviors and characteristics of some of the most successful researchers. Um, by the way, for the admins, I'm hearing the uh, sound murmur in the background here that's quite distracting. If there's a way you could kill that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, it's fixed. Okay, um, so I wish I'd known these things as a graduate student in the early stages of my career, but I don't have access to Doc Brown and I don't have access to his DeLorean, but I will share with you today for those of you that can benefit um, where I couldn't. So starting out for those of you still taking classes, for those of you still in graduate school, um, High performance graphics is a, is, a, is a field, is a sport where we have this whole stack, this really, really broad range of skill sets and areas that our field impacts. We start from everywhere from the highest level of theory and algorithm work all the way down to custom design hardware specifically for our field. Very few other fields of computer science have that broad range. And it covers everything from hardware design operating system slash driver design. We have programming languages specifically designed for our field, by our field, um, as well as the graphics algorithms that we love. Obviously, parallel programming is also at the heart of this. But um, I, I see that the most impactful researchers in our field have this broad knowledge and didn't specialize too early. And I'm really grateful for the University of Utah, where at the time I was there as a graduate student, we were required to take these broad range of classes before specializing in, in computer graphics. And I, I, I end up relying on this, this breadth on a regular basis in, in my own career and job. And I see this among top researchers. As a capstone to the coursework, um, again, I wanna, I wanna credit University of Utah, specifically Wilson Shea uh, was the, the compiler's professor at Utah. When I was there, he's now been at Google for many, many years. Um, but Wilson gave us this just absolutely beast of a compiler's course where we built from the ground up a, a, sub, a language which was a subset of Java. And what I found is that it, it required bringing together knowledge of computer architecture, ISA design, operating systems, programming language implementation and theory, software engineering, teamwork, and more. And I see this throughout research that the researchers who've built compilers before, even if they're not themselves building compilers, stand out and are able to impact a wider range of our field of high performance graphics. And again, specifically to our field, um, it so happens that I think every single job I have had, starting from my first internship at Pixar almost 20 years ago, um, has involved every, all of these have been computer graphics jobs, all of these have been in high performance graphics. And all of them, I have been, either been building a compiler or overseeing groups building or changing compilers. It's compilers are an integral part of our field, but even if you don't intend to or expect to ever be building a compiler, take the hardest compiler class you can find. It brings all this together and gives you the ability to innovate across our entire stack. Internships are a key part of the graduate experience. And I see many graduate students um, understand this and pursue it, and, and some skip this, and I, or some maybe do it differently than, um, than I think you could. And, and I want to give you this perspective as a, as a leader of a research team that internships are an extended job interview for both you, the student, and the employer, for you to find out what's this company actually like to work at, and um, what's this group like to work with, and for the employer to find out what's this student with this great resume I actually like to work with. Um, so I strongly encourage you to intern at multiple companies throughout your graduate degree and to give it your absolute all. Um, don't multitask your life while you're doing your internship. It should absolutely consume you and you should give it your best and your all because it really is an extended job interview. 
Um, but it, it's it's a tremendous opportunity to increase your um, the people you're collaborating with and broaden your research beyond your uh, graduate research group. And certainly when interns, uh, when more senior graduate students come in and turn with us, people have a few papers already, we give them autonomy almost um, the same as a, a full-time research scientist. Um, it's really expected that people come in and, and act as full-time research scientists. And so to take that opportunity while you're a student, it's something unique to the experience. Funding. A graduate student, I certainly didn't think that much about funding as, as a graduate student, um, but it's, you know, there are very few people in the world who have the opportunity to gaze at the sky and think, what problem should I go solve today, this month, this year? Um, most people are under a lot more direction than that to deliver something that's going to generate obvious value in the near future. But as graduate students and industry researchers, we have this incredible freedom. Why is that? I think it's important to, to ask that. I had seen industry groups and labs um, do uh, be, be flourish and grow and then overnight almost disappear. Um, it's important to understand who's paying you and why. So if you, if you are a graduate student, read the grant proposals that your professor wrote that are funding you and understand what your professor is accountable for in your research. And if you're an industry researcher starting out, understand why the CEO of your company and the management above you is funding your research group. What are their hopes and dreams of what's going to come out of funding that you as a researcher to stare at the sky and dream? Um, let those funding goals influence your, your big picture, your answer to the question of if the project is wildly successful, what will change? What will the impact be? But don't let that funding dictate exactly which problem you're going to solve in which order or the details of your journey. That kind of fine-grained management is development, not research. The funding goals are there to specify the, the what if I'm wildly successful dreams. So about those dreams. Again, there's very few people in the world who have the opportunity to be in a research position. Those of us who have or are in these research positions, it is our job to take the biggest risks and seek out high risk, high reward objectives. Um, those who are in product groups are also tasked with doing unknowns all the time, with pursuing solving problems that haven't been solved before, but they can't take as much risk. I'll use a mountain analogy. On the left, we have a mountain, which is pretty sure you're gonna be able to climb it, even if it's never been climbed before, this one has given the trail. But um, it's our job as researchers to be more like the mountaineers on the right, dream big, take high risk, high reward research, but also learning to manage the risk along that journey and be profitable along that journey where profit might mean that doesn't mean making money. It means you learn something. You learn what not to do. That's important as well. Um, and you, it's also important to be able to say, I'm not ready for that challenge right now. I'm going to go off in this direction. Risk management is a big part of doing research, but dream big, ignore the projects that lead to easy publications. Sometimes I receive resumes of applicants that have long lists of publications and they're small publications, they're low impact publications, and it doesn't get my attention. That person may not even get an interview. Someone might give me a resume with just a few small number of papers that completely change the field. That's going to get a lot more attention. Um, it's about the impact of your work, not the number of publications. Go after the high risk endeavors. Collaboration is something that people talk about. It, the word is used a lot. Oh, let's collaborate. The halls of HPG or in-person HPG, in-person SIGGRAPH, run into someone and, hey, have you thought about collaborating? Yes, collaborate. Oh, so and so I collaborate. I, I, use the, I hear the word used a lot and what I deem incorrectly. And so I'm going to today provide you a very specific definition of the term and encourage you to um, use this to separate what is collaboration, what is not in your own life. And that is that collaboration involves actively contributing to shared code or paper repository. Anything else is talking. Now, talking is useful. Talking is how ideas get generated in talking, lunch conversations, hallway conversations, on the phone, um, personal connections are built. Talking is an important part of being a research scientist, but it's not collaboration. And another thing that I often see people call collaboration that isn't 
are people who are working on similar problems in their own code base, in their own sandboxes, and they're talking about it, but they're not sharing code repository. That doesn't lead to something bigger. That, that leads to n people solving n problems at n, n small sizes. True collaboration where you're sharing a code base can lead to much bigger impact. I see this throughout the time I've been at NVIDIA um, in the creation of some of the most impactful technologies that have come out of graphics research. Um, Dave Lupke and Alex Keller, my organizations, are where people join in true collaboration, and that's when things start to scale up. Related to collaboration are your academic competitors. Um, in, the, in the world of research and publishing, it's important to be first and to have the idea first and to tell people about it. But watch who your academic competitors are and consider, instead of continuing forever to be competitors with them, consider actually collaborating with them. Because if you are publishing so closely together that you're competing with each other, that person or that group shares a passion for the same research that you do, and they might make great collaborators. Um, there were a group of us back in graduate school um, who were in the early days of general purpose programming and GPUs or GPGPU. And it might have seemed we were competitors because we were, just, we were first discovering that you could do these weird, crazy things with GPUs. But we, in many ways, we were working together um, and we were giving courses together. We um, became, became friends and, and collaborators. I'll, I'll give a, a, a near-term um, recent anecdote about this. Um, the, there was a paper at HPG last year um, uh, led by a, a, a person named Yao Bin, who's a developer technology engineer at NVIDIA. And uh, it was in collaboration with my team. And the way that came about is that um, Chris Wyman discovered on the internal channels that Yao Bin, who was a dev tech engineer in China, had seen our restore work, had extended it to work with diffuse indirect illumination and implemented it in a branch of Unreal Engine um, and was making some great progress with it. We have this rule in NVIDIA that nobody gets to own something. Although the restore work started with Chris and Benedict and others in my team, I'm not the manager of restore. I don't get to own all innovation in, in restore because I'm many collaborators across the uh, in, in academia and, industry in this, but um, when we saw that, instead of viewing Yalbin as a competitor, we said, well, wait a minute, this is fantastic. We want to work with you. I invited him into a staff meeting. Um, Matt Farr, Chris Wyman, and others said, Yalbin, let's let's write an HPG paper. We'll help you. And that um, was a paper that was was shown here last year at the conference. So view your, your academic competitors as potential collaborators. The uh, next are mentors. Um, I had someone early in my career, and I was still a graduate student, advise me to, to seek out multiple mentors in my life. In fact, I think I, this was during my undergraduate at, at Whitman College. Um, but it wasn't specified exactly what to look for in those mentors. And um, the, uh, what I've seen is that the, the people who, who, um, who are most successful in their careers have very thoughtfully sought out a collection of mentors that evolves over time as, you, as your career progresses. Um, Seek out mentors, of course, the, the obvious piece of this is that they have something to teach you, but evaluate your candidate mentors to ensure that these are people who will put your career advancement needs before their own and not be someone that's gonna take credit for your work that will elevate you. Um, and, and that goes along with being someone that you can trust, but also turn that around and be a mentor. Again, I see some of the most successful researchers, both, um, uh, having a, a constellation of mentors for different aspects of their career, as well as being mentors. And um, those mentees grow into future collaborators. And um, it's an important part, important part of our field. And lastly, I've mentioned credit a couple of times. This is something that I, I spend a lot of time as a, uh, as a research manager coaching, um, and that is to give credit rather than take credit. Credit's important as a research scientist. It's important to have your name on papers, on patents, on talks. Um, but the it, but what I see happen time and time again, and really try to prevent, certainly in my organization, is that not giving credit can permanently end collaborative relationships. It can be really, really disastrous. Um, and uh, for those of you who have name has been left off of papers that you feel like they should have been on, you know how this feels. 
And my advice to you is that giving credit costs you almost nothing. Not giving credit can cost you everything. Um, and be sure to credit both ideas and effort. And this isn't just um, <laughs> this. This is not just about um, who wrote the code, and it's not just about names on papers. Um, it's also about um, when you're giving talks informally, even when you're talking within your group or your company. Um, throughout, if, if you, you know, remember where an idea came from and just drop that name and credit it, um, it, it, it builds community. It becomes a lifeblood of collaboration to be someone who's giving credit rather than taking it. People are, want to work, are attracted to work with you if they know that they're going to get credit and not have credit taken from them. Credit both it is an effort. And with that, I thank you. For those of you in the early stages of your career, uh, I wish you the best, and I look forward to uh, to seeing your work and the impact on our field. Yeah, happy to take some questions.